Where did it end? All right, a very good afternoon, everyone. Magandang hapon po sa ating lahat. We're just letting everyone enter the, the meeting, the webinar room, and we will begin shortly. Thank you for um, your patience in waiting as we were trying to get some technical matters sorted out. We hope you've had your lunch and um, Feel free to take a moment and get yourself a cup of coffee, tea, or something to drink. Okay, we have 100 people in the webinar, so I guess this is a, a perfect um, moment to start. Again, good afternoon, friends and partners in the labor migration space. Welcome to this forum towards a feminist labor migration policy, reimagining the future of Philippine labor migration governance. I am Kathy Torres, Program Officer at UN Women, and I will be your moderator this afternoon. Feminism, it is a word and concept that is rarely spoken in policy circles, which is why it seemed particularly bold when a few years ago, some countries, some national governments declared that they would embrace a feminist foreign policy or a feminist development assistance policy. It has been eight years since Sweden became the first country to make such a pronouncement. Others have followed suit, among them Mexico, Canada, and Germany. More than addressing structural inequalities between men and women, the Center for Feminist Foreign Policy defines such a policy as centering on the well-being of marginalized peoples. Many migrant workers experience marginalization. Often this marginalization is what drives them to migrate in the first place, only to end up being marginalized further in their countries of destination due to unfair work conditions or lack of social acceptance, for example. The COVID-19 pandemic further aggravated this equation. In so doing, it also raised critical questions about the challenges that await migrant workers as we confront the climate crisis and the environmental crisis and our world becomes more inhospitable. Our hope this afternoon is, engage, to, is to engage with all of you in conversation and how we might prevent or surmount this bleak scenario by reimagining Philippine labor migration policy. In particular, we want to delve into how feminist ideas might help us to future-proof our labor migration policy. So we are honored this afternoon to have with us a diverse roster of speakers who will approach this question from both a theoretical and practical standpoint. But before we go on to the presentation, we first would like to hear from the organizers of this forum, who will give us a deeper context of what is at stake in this conversation. To get things started, I would like to invite a person who has herself worked closely with our OFWs and other migrant workers. From 2012 to 2017, she served as executive director of Enrich, a Hong Kong-based NGO, and was instrumental in its growth as one of the most recognized charities in Hong Kong that provides economic empowerment through financial education and personal development programs for migrant domestic workers and ethnic minorities. Now the country program coordinator, of the United Nations Entity for Gender Equality and the Empowerment of Women. Friends, let us welcome Ms. Rosaline Lenlen Messina. Lenlen, Thank please. So Thank you so much, Kathy. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm just amazed with how many 
people really are very interested to hear and reflect about how we are envisioning or how we can envision a feminist migration policy and what that means for us as a country, as a nation who sends, um, you know, people out to offer, you know, to, to, to find opportunities abroad, support families and support the country back. Um, but yeah, before I begin, I'd like to say good afternoon and hello to our representatives from the Department of Migrant Workers, Under Secretary P.Y. Kaunan, Her Excellency Ambassador Anke Ray Consuel, UPC Fall Director Dr. Edna Ko and team, Dr. Cleovi Masuela, Dr. Josephine Celerio, hi Jo, partners from the government, civil society, the UN family, especially IOM and ILO, who are partners um, of Bridge in this joint program, OFWs and other migrants and their families, and I would suppose students of migration governance as well. This week and in the coming weeks, we would see and we would hear of our economic and development planners trying to put together the very first um, six-year Philippine development plan after the pandemic hit us. And it is also after the Department of Migrant Workers was created. I think this is really an opportune time for us to reflect and think of ways how we can engage and how we could really try support shaping a more people-centered migration policy because these are opportunities that we could think of. UN Women last year have released many studies and many reports that really showed how the COVID-19 has put a shining light to the different impacts that it has caused to women and girls and how much of that really has really um, shown that the socioeconomic systems are failing our women and girls, whether that's in the space of work, that's in the space of protection, that's in the space of um other policies that needs and that we expect to support and um ensure that they their rights are upheld the studies um specifically the beyond covid 19 a feminist plan for sustainability and social justice also mentioned how the there are two parallel crises that was ongoing um, accompanying the covid 19 which is the livelihoods crisis and the care crisis which I think many of you would agree has significantly affected the migrant workers, particularly the women migrant workers. Earlier this month, IOM and the Scalability Migration Center also released a three, policy, three policy briefs that are um, based on the deeper dive into data that was collected in a survey funded by the Federal Republic of Germany, um, wherein they have surveyed over 8,000 OFWs who returned to the Philippines uh, from different countries during the earlier days of the pandemic. The findings highlighted that among those who returned, 44% were either unemployed already or precariously employed prior to their migration, with the number particularly high in Mindanao. Another finding was that among those who were employed before migration, the top industries were were in the hotel, office work, health and social work. So they are professionals prior to their migration. Domestic work did not figure out as among the top industries where they were before migration, but became their leading occupation when they went abroad or worked abroad. Somewhat heartbreakingly, 48% of those returnees surveyed expressed that they are intending to go and return or remigrate forcing us to reckon with the lack of viable opportunities for them to integrate, particularly in the, at the economic front. What does this mean in a world where human security is increasingly threatened by pandemics and other disasters linked to human-induced climate and environmental change alongside violent conflicts abroad and here as well in the country? What does it mean in particular for women and girls and other marginalized groups such as indigenous peoples and people with disability who stand to be the hardest hit on all fronts, from gender-based violence linked to war and conflict to unequal access to assistance in humanitarian emergencies, to heightened care burden and amid health emergencies. 
the compounding challenges faced by these groups, which have knocked on effects on society that adversely impact all of us, make it imperative that we push the boundaries of our collective imagination to think of bolder responses to the existential challenges confronting humanity. The feminist approach to foreign policy or to in international development policy that some countries have embraced, as Kathy mentioned earlier, an approach where we center around the well-being of marginalized people, to borrow the words from the Center for Feminist Foreign Policy, is an example of such an ambition. And I really am very excited to hear about the thoughts of our speakers and your thoughts to us participants to this conversation. As a leading migrant sending country that prides itself on its good practices and innovation in safeguarding migrant workers and promoting their welfare, the Philippines is well placed to espouse such a feminist approach in the area of labor migration. This is especially more so because the Philippines sends more female migrant workers abroad. Almost six female OFWs to every four males, bucking the global trend where countries send out more male migrant workers. Among others, such an approach would entail moving away from the extractive arrangements that characterize ties between employer and employee, sending country and country of destination, and replace them with more just, equitable, and regenerative solutions and relations. In this webinar today, we will hear insights and reflections drawn from research and practice to help us imagine the contours of such an approach. We are grateful to our speakers today for accepting um, this invitation to be part of this conversation. And we hope that their presentations will spur a lively exchange with you, our esteemed audience members, drawing on your diverse experiences in the labor migration space and how you also would like to envision really an, a, a foreign migration policy that benefits all of us. Magandang hapon po, and we hope to have a productive and insightful conversation with all of you. Over to you, Kathy. Thank you very much, Len Len. And uh, you referred to the Philippines leadership and good practices in the area of labor migration governance. And I think right in this very webinar room, we have a deep repository of skills and knowledge um, because we have practitioners from different government agencies involved in labor migration governance alongside civil society representatives, migrant groups, as well as perhaps some migrants themselves and, and scholars working in this area. And we'll be hearing from more of them later. In the meantime, I now would like to invite um, the director of our co-organizer of this webinar um, of UPC File Philippines. And UPC File Philippines it is, is itself one of the leaders in promoting enhanced labor migration policies and programs through its professional course on global migration, which is ongoing in fact. UPC Falls director is a professor of public administration and the former dean of the University of the Philippines National College of Public Administration and Governance. She also serves as an advisory council member of the Civil Service Commission of the Philippines and is a consultant to several national and international development organizations and international political foundations. Friends, let's hear from Dr. Edna Estefania Ko. Dr. Edna, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Kathy. And I'm, uh, apolo I apologize for the inconvenience of the technical problem uh, that uh, you know, uh, affected me. Uh, I'm sorry about that, but uh, I think I will make my uh, collaborative message very short. That's just not to uh, sort of divert us all from the main topics and discussion. I just want to say first that I'd like to thank the UN Women and our collaborators in this undertaking for holding hands with the UPC FAL Philippines in pursuing this uh, webinar, uh, this activity today, which is towards a feminist labor migration policy, reimagining the future of Philippine labor migration governance. Uh, today, I'm sure we all look forward to more uh, meaty discussion and presentation. But uh, on top of this, what we want to really emphasize 
and we we share with the UN women in this undertaking of looking into the issues of uh, of feminist labor. Uh, one is that the CIFAL Philippines is uh, primarily involved also in the promotion of the sustainable development goals. Believe that um, feminist labor migration is very much embedded in so many of the sustainable development goals, including but not limited to, for example, sustainable development goals number five, which is gender equality, sustainable development goal number eight, which is about decent work and economic growth, and many other uh, sustainable development goals, particularly SDG 16 as well, which is about peace and strong institutions. This means that we cannot leave behind feminist labor migration on all the dimensions of sustainable development goals because half of our concern for humanity, a universal concern is of course, uh, lying on the uh, principle of SDG, which is exactly inclusiveness, inclusivity. We cannot leave behind in migration 50% of its force, which is the women, the feminists. And therefore, it is for this reason and many more that we hold hands with the UN women in the promotion and in fact, in the conduct of capacity building to promote inclusivity, equality in the recognition that our world of migration is largely is a big portion of it is about uh, feminist labor. It is for this reason as well that we are conscious that apart from and based on the discourse and discussion that will arise today in this afternoon's forum, we will be able to contribute to the drafting of formulation. It looks like I'm making a promise but as an academic institution, as a university, one of our important roles is to shape the minds, influence the minds so that we can submit something as a policy output to the people who matter and who shape policies, who shape decisions, which are crucial. In other words, as an academic-based CIFAL institution of the UN Institute for Training and Research, our role is to help clarify the issue, to shape the minds of people so that in the end, through our intellectual outputs and contribution, we may help change come about. The change that is directed at making a more equal society and a more sustainable development. With this, therefore, I uh, also welcome you all together with the UN Women, and I also see here people from the IOM, that uh, we all have a mission to collaborate, to hold hands. All of us will have to work not only towards the future, right here, right now. We should reimagine and reframe the, uh, the Philippine labor migration governance by highlighting feminist labor migration. More e uh, around inclusivity and equality and fairness. With this, I uh, welcome you all again, and I thank everyone. We will keenly listen to the discourse and probably produce uh, a significant output from this activity. Maraming uh, salamat at uh, magandang hapon sa ating lahat. Thank you very much, Dr. Ko, for that uplifting message. And I think we are a country that has been shaped by a long history of migration. So hopefully the intent of helping to shape the minds and hearts of our young people who will eventually shape our future policies, it won't be so hard because it is growing on a rich and fertile soil that has seen how migration can change lives. So in recent months, the newly created Department of Migrant Workers, or DMW, has emerged as the center of gravity of the conversation about Philippine labor migration policy.
I believe many of us working in this space gave a sigh of relief when leadership of the ministry was given um, to Secretary Toots Ople. She has, to put it simply, been working with N4 ROFWs, especially those in distress, for much of her life. She is also a staunch advocate of gender equality, advocating for the passage of the SOGI Equality Bill, among others. Um, unfortunately, I think um, Secretary Ople herself has another engagement this afternoon and won't be able to join us. But we are very honored that she has nonetheless um, asked that one of her undersecretaries, one of her deputies, will be joining us. So our next um, presenter who will be delivering the message of Secretary Ople is a practicing lawyer who has worked extensively both in private practice and in the corporate world. After her stint in the corporate world, um, she has also done work with our OFWs, including giving free legal assistance and advice to OFWs, and she co-organized more than 300 Zoom conferences and other events with OFWs all over the world with the different cabinet secretaries and government officials with the intent to instantly address their concerns. She graduated with a degree in commerce, major in management of financial institutions at the De La Salle University, Manila, and obtained her Juris Doctor from the University of the Philippines College of Law and passed the Philippine Bar in 2009. She is currently finishing her Diploma for Labor Migration Experts and Practitioners with the ILO International Training Center. So I would now like to invite Attorney, the Undersecretary for Policy and International Cooperation of the DMW, Attorney Patricia Yvonne P.Y. Kaunan. Magandang, you said, please. Thank you very much. Magandang hapon to everyone attending today's program. Good afternoon. It is a great honor and indeed uh, a great source of comfort to know that everyone here is the Department of Migrant Workers Allies, not just in protecting the welfare of migrant workers as a whole, but also in finding solutions to issues that affect some of our more vulnerable members. Indeed, we in the DMW cannot think of a better way to spend its maiden year of existence than to work with institutions like UPCFAL, UP, UN Women, and academic institutions like the UP Asian Center and the University of Hamburg in finding evidence and research-based policies that will look at migration as an inevitable phenomenon that simultaneously presents challenges and opportunities. Migration has been a part of human history for far longer than humans have had formal structures of society and government. Migration and human survival and progress have been inextricable ever since. Migration has thrived even in times of upheaval and great change. And every indication points to the probability that migration will persist in spite of pandemics, armed conflicts, and any and all government's efforts to put up visible and invisible walls at their borders. Much the same way that roots always find water and how water always finds its level, humans will always wind up moving towards what sustains us. That is more or less inevitably inevitability of human migration. Yet as age old as the phenomenon of human migration is, so are some of the challenges that it faces and creates. Perhaps more so, now in more modern times than in the past. One of those is the distinct vulnerability of some migrants more than others, the less educated or less skilled, those on the more extreme ends of the age spectrum and women. In the context of Filipino migrant workers, those three criteria often converge to create one of our most, if not the most, vulnerable and therefore our most regulated category of migrants. Domestic or household workers who are predominantly women. No matter how modern and advanced contemporary society is, pretty much many of the threats that they face are the same. Exploitation, abuse, and in general, the inability to meaningfully exercise the right to self-determination. Because frankly, 
if they were given a choice, many, if not all, would choose to spend their productive years in the company of their family, their loved ones. Many would rather have economic stability and personal security in the land of their birth. Many would want to experience more of the positive aspects of life while they can still enjoy and appreciate it, such as uh, travel and vacations and simple rest and sleep. And many would want to spend their twilight years with time born of the knowledge that they do not have to work until the day they die in order to provide food, shelter, and medical care for themselves and their loved ones. We know this for a fact because of our National Economic Development Authority launched a study that resulted in the paper entitled Ambition Natin 2040, which states in unequivocal terms while being supported by empirical data that our aspirations as a Filipino nation and as individuals are pretty much the same. Gusto natin ng buhay na matatag, maginhawa at panatag. Lives that are stable with strong roots, comfortable and secure. We have less than two decades left to realize those aspirations and yet evidence shows that our vulnerable sectors, our women, children, are as vulnerable as ever. By sex, more women were reported to be working overseas, accounting for 59.6% or 1.06 million in 2020. The same trend was observed in 2019, where 55.4% of the total 2.18 million of OFWs deployed were women. Among the 1.06 million female OFWs deployed in 2020, majority or 70.3% of were engaged in elementary occupation, which is defined as consisting of simple and routine tasks, which mainly required the use of handheld tools and often some physical effort. Despite being the greater in number, female Filipino migrant workers bring home disproportionately lower amounts of remittances that is merely an estimated uh, 56.9 billion out of the total 134.8 billion pesos in 2020 or a mere 42 percent. It says that more Filipino women leave their families, more of them work in vulnerable sectors, yet they collectively are the lesser economic power in terms of remittances. In, simple, in simpler terms, more man hours and lesser pay. This is but one illustration how the wage gap between men and women migrant workers persists, which will only exacerbate the income inequality that put women at a disadvantage. And in the reality we currently live in, income inequality means social inequality. Social inequality means political inequality and political inequality means vulnerability. This is, to put it mildly, is the exact opposite of what Filipinos aspire for. Stability, comfort, and security. Wala na sigurong mas malinaw na ebidensya ng pagiging vulnerable na ating mga kababaihan sa konteksto ng migration kundi sa datos ukol sa human trafficking o yung tinatawag na makabagong pang-aalipin or modern day slavery. Without a doubt, human trafficking is a global problem. But just as clearly, it is distinctly a gendered crime. Data shows clearly that vast majority of victims of human trafficking, 71% to be more exact, are women and girls. They are not just primary victims. They're also often reportedly coerced into ensnaring other vulnerable groups in exchange for greater freedoms. In other words, by preying on the distinct vulnerability of women. They are further used to perpetrate the same crimes against other women. We may argue whether it makes them any less culpable, but the fact is that by making them complicit in the crime, it becomes harder to bring justice to the victims and an end to this problem. That is why we, in the Department of Migrant Workers, are taking every step to look at migrant workers' concerns from various lenses including the gender lens. We want to be less of a regulatory agency and more of an inclusive, nurturing, problem resolving and cooperative department that facilitates our people's search for the life they want to create for themselves and their families. 
we want to reimagine the role of government in labor migration governance from purely punitive, but more and more about the empowerment of the migrant workers themselves. Because we are at juncture where age old problems requiring long delayed solutions are colliding with modern problems. While we are still dealing with modern forms of slavery and traditional problems arising from the cross border effects of force majeure like pandemics and armed conflict, modern problems are fast bearing down on us from the effects of climate change on migrants as a whole, the effects of advancements in technology, such as automation, advances in machine learning and digitalization on migrant workers in general, and the effect of econ economic and social inequality on women migrant workers in particular. We have already gotten a glimpse of how some of these problems affect the supply and demand of migrant law labor now, and more importantly, the welfare of the migrants themselves. We have to find solutions before they become so entrenched that they make our ambitions for a stable, comfortable, and secure nation become harder than ever to achieve. Now is the time for a paradigm shift. Malino po sana ng Department of Migrant Workers, ang tahanan ng lahat ng babae man, lalaki man, bata man, matanda man, manggagawa man o kaanak o kapwa Pilipino na kikinabang sa mga sakripisyo ng ating mga migranteng magagawa. Let it be clear, therefore, that we are taking a feminist approach to many problems because feminist issues are human issues, and human issues are feminist issues. That is why a feminist migration policy is critical, not because women intrinsically deserve more protection, but because it will take more effort to make them less vulnerable and therefore less prone to being victimized and being coerced into victimizing others. That is why we in the DMW have a simple aspiration. Kung meron mga mga Pilipinong migranteng manggagawa sa susunod na mga dekada, let them be able to make that choice freely while running towards what fulfills them as human beings and not because they are running away from their harsh realities here in our country. Let us work together to achieve this by eliminating the sources of vulnerabilities and empower everyone to be able to make choices that, not, that are not only the best available, but objectively the best option for them as human beings. Because an empowered and protected Filipino migrant workforce makes for an empowered and protected Filipino nation. Maraming salamat po, UP Cifal, UP Women. Thank you very much. And I wish everyone a productive afternoon. Thank you for your support sa amin po sa Department of Migrant Workers. Thank you very much, Yusek, and of course, also to Secretary Ople. And I think um, what you have shared with us is really music to the ears of many of us in this room in terms of um, the desire of DMW to be more than a regulatory agency, to move from more punitive approaches, but really to considering our migrant workers are, as partners in bringing about that matatag, maginhawa at panatag na buhay that we all aspire for. Thank you very much again, Yusek. And I think one of the situations, one of the particular realities that many women migrant workers face that shows um, the challenges that need to be confronted with feminist approaches may be found in the situation of mothers who have to leave their children behind as they seek employment, sometimes looking after other people's children overseas. There is no hel helicopter parenting for these women. Mothering is done from a distance with the time and resources left over from their often physically and emotionally demanding jobs. Our next presenter will be sharing with us how the proliferation of and how the digital age and um, developments in recent decades is affecting mothering across the distance. An associate professor at the Asian Center, University of the Philippines, she obtained her PhD in international studies at the Waseda University in Tokyo, Japan, 
two masters from Sophia University, also in Japan and the University of the Philippines, and a bachelor in secondary education from the Philippine Normal University. She has done extensive research and published widely on Japan studies and Philippine-Japan relations, including Filipino migration to Japan. Friends, let's listen to Dr. Jocelyn Celero. Dr. Celero, please. Thank you very much, Kathy, for that very wonderful introduction. I am humbled uh, for this opportunity to be able to share a portion of my ongoing, in fact, long-term, long-duration research no, on transnational families. Um, transnational families constitute um, living configurations of geographically dispersed family members of arising as an outcome of labor migration, intermarriage, and settlement across national borders. Well, there has been many studies done on this topic, particularly in the fields of migration studies as well as media studies. Allow me to share some insights into this theme based on my 12 years of ethnographic research in Tokyo, talking to hundreds of Filipinos there, following their lives in various portals, online and offline, but mainly through Facebook and Malago Forum, which I will talk about extensively in the, uh, the central part of my presentation today as well as the two papers that I have written as a graduate student. One, I wrote for my globalization and society class back in 2011, and this digital media in Southeast Asian family workshop at uh, La Trobe University back in 2017, and also some insights, um, some recent um, data that I collected while I was on a fellowship in Tokyo uh, just this July you know, until September uh, last, uh, yeah, just this month, no, beginning of this month. So the concept of transnational families, I'm not sure if everyone in the audience is familiar, is in fact fundamentally rooted no, in uh, this ongoing global wide crisis of care, no? care for aging members of the family, care for less desirable and aging men in the global north, care for children of expat and affluent families where women, mothers and spouses, please go back to the previous slide, where women, um, uh, uh, women uh, or spouses have career tracks to keep so that women in the global south, such as our women, are outsourced for their maternal care. So this presentation is divided into six parts. Um, I'll first uh, revisit the concepts of uh, transnational motherhood and mothering. Um, and then I will uh, contextualize this, the use of these concepts to so the experiences of our Filipino women. Uh, I will also revisit the digital, digitalization process no, of transnational mothering practices. And then I'll provide an overview of Filipino migrant mothers um, practicing transnational mothering. And uh, also I will uh, zero in on uh, two cases, no, two case studies of transnational mothering online community sites. And then I will end by highlighting some of the key points that uh, uh, reflect on the research and policy implications of my study. So uh, next slide, please. Transnationalism as a paradigm or theoretical framework you know, for understanding family and parenting and other practices shared by migrant men and women gained prominence back in the 1990s, you know, courtesy of uh, Nina Glickschiller, the sociologist, and uh, some of her colleagues. Um, who simply theorized, who used transnationalism to theorize that migrants or trans migrants specifically, while adapting to host society, continue to maintain connections with the homeland so that they tend to be orientated towards um, two or uh, at least two or more uh, societies. The concept of transnational motherhood became popular th thanks to the work of uh, the sociologist by the name of Pirit, called Daniel Sotelo and her student, Avila, um, who examined no, the child-rearing arrangements of Latina migrant workers uh, working as nannies and house helpers in Los Angeles, USA. Transnational mothering became a significant concept among feminist migration scholars who emphasize the practice of parenting uh, that gives a sense of mother, uh, mother identity no, or motherhood. Father Nilo Tanalega, no, the founder of Ogat Foundation, um, coined the term global parenting no, in his work with migrants and their families, the so Filipino families no, abroad, um, to stress how technology has revolutionized communication, 
between both male and female Filipino parents and their stay-behind children. Now, compared to this more encompassing gender-neutral gender notion, no, global parenting, I would underscore, however, that the, the concept of transnational mothering has a far more complex meaning when depicting the greater contemporary social re reality lived by Filipino women no? who bear most of the costs of managing family life across borders. Next slide, please. Much of what has been written about the relationship between gender, migration, and digital media illustrate that um, transnational migrant mothers are connected maternal migrants. There are two dominant bodies of research that explain transnational mothers' connection and connectedness. The first set of literature focuses on migrant women who may be migrant workers or marriage migrants no, in host society, uh, and they, they raise their children no, with them. These studies problematize the difficulty of accessing information and social services. Um, thus, they use various ICTs to cope with these limitations. The second bodies of scholarship um, consists of those researches that investigate the migrant uh, working mother stay behind children family structure where mothers utilize ICT to sustain emotional bonds with their children um, and their husbands as well. No? More recent and exceptional studies such as the work of uh, Leia Williams BC and, and uh, a British Australian uh, scholar explored how transnational mothers uh, in Australia do not only strive to stay connected with their families in their country of origin but also utilize online communities uh, to link to other migrant mothers in receiving country. Next slide, please. As mentioned previously, um, I, I uh, argue that the concept of transnational mothering um, means so much, no? so much more when we look at the Filipino experience, given that the Filipino diaspora in the recent years is becoming more and more feminized no? with the migration of more women than men, no? as, as um, uh, highlighted no? in, in Ms. Len's uh, introduction, introductory speech. No? Because of this trend, as Perenia uh, suggests, there is an increasing prevalence of female-headed transnational families, which has which have significantly affected the family as a social unit, no? the family in the traditional Filipino sense. No? And the prevailing gender order, which is supposed to require redistribution of household and familial duties among left behind members for its maintenance. This has brought tremendous socioeconomic change to until the 20th, uh, 20th century, when the Philippines became one of nation states that have long adhered to traditional ideology of women domesticity um, you know, has been bombarded no, with the impact of the migration of its women. So, so the transnational mothering has challenged this traditional ideology that a woman's rightful, rightful place is in the home and she is solely responsible for child rearing and maintaining mother and child intimacy. As Filipino women create strategies for maintaining family relations, they begin to reflect on what it means to be a good mother. Such active assessment on the role and practice of mothering across time and space due to the advent of communication technologies is becoming both individual as well as communal and or collective as more recent studies show, no? like the works of Dr. Valerie Francis Francisco Menchavez who looked into the lives of Filipino domestic workers no, in New York City, uh, forming communities of care as she termed. And also my, my research, looking into the how permanent resident no, Filipinas are employing online communities to complement their off offline networks of care. Next slide, please. So, uh, so this uh, very short timeline no, shows us the transformation in the transnationality of mothering practices, which intertwines with significantly with the advent of digital communication technologies no, over the last three decades. We all witnessed these innovations in ICT from 1990s to the present. And just to highlight, but just to highlight no, a few of these technological moments, no. Um, so we've lived with the 1990s, no, where there's still email, postmail, and telephone. And because of this, uh, uh, phone card business was one of the most booming businesses um, in Japan back during this decade, in fact. 
Um, by 2000s, technology-based interaction between transmigrant mothers and their children became more prominent with the use of cellular phones. Um, and uh, that phased out the traditional forms of communication, no, telephone, uh, you know, paid, uh, prepaid no, uh, phone cards, and shift the mode of communication from textual to visual. So cell phones simultaneously reinvent the concept of transnational mothering through real-time and constant communication and reinstate the importance, however, of the traditional ideals of motherhood, meaning corporeal presence in everyday life activities of children. So online communities also started to uh, um, uh, emerge uh, by the late 2000, mid 2000s, no? um, so that by 2010s, you have uh, smartphones becoming more and more prominently used uh, together with a variety of affordable digital media technologies and applications as listed. No? But I'd like to emphasize how online community sites have been viable virtual uh, sources no, of information. They have become boundless spaces no, for articulating moments of social relations and understandings where trans migrant mothers can participate in the pooling of relations, experiences, resources for practicing transnational mothering. Next slide, please. So the next, the next couple of slides, uh, I'm going to show you some statistical evidence as to why transnational mothering is conceptually more relevant when we look at the Philippine context, especially in the recent years. No? So how feminized is the nature of migration and diasporic presence of Filipinos abroad? No? We can look at the status of pre-departure, no? as you can see here. Sorry, if maybe the one highlighted, the first category under unemployed is housewives. So you have here 147,579 departing mothers between 2008 to 2018. And it's accounting for 16% of women uh, leaving the country you know, over the last 10 years. Um, but that also invisibilizes the fact that there are a lot of women who are also mothers in other uh, employed sectors listed there. No. Um, Next slide, please. So PSA has uh, uh, conducted a survey in 2019 and also released this report and highlighted some of these characteristics of feminized Filipino migration. No? One of which is the fact that um, there are more female migrants than uh, males, no? 56% versus 44%. The largest proportion of women leaving the country belong to the age 30 years, uh, 30 years old, uh, followed by 25 to 29. I think that's 30 to 34 years old, the first one. That's 22.6%. Followed by the 25 to 29 years old bracket, accounting for 20, almost 21% of women leaving the Philippines. Um, and then there are more younger female OFWs, no? uh, for belonging to 15 to 24 years old uh, uh, age group, followed by 47, overwhelming 47% of them uh, from the 25 to 35 years old age bracket. 18% uh, of unemployed women who migrate are housewives like, housewives, like I've shown in the previous slide, reuniting with their family abroad. And then 92% of marriage migrants are women. Next slide. So the feminized migration of feminized nature of Filipino migration no, can also be seen in the intra, within, and inter between no, Asian regions. Um, the patterns of mobility of Filipinas are uh, very much influenced by the productive and reproductive labor demands in destination countries, but also the practical side of working within Asia, which means near the Philippines, no? uh, essentially to routinize vacation trips from time to time. It is also important to underscore that Filipino women occupy a range of visa categories in receiving countries, as you can see in the right side of my slide. No? They, they can be temporary migrant workers, no? they can be domestic helpers or working in the sales and service sectors. They're probably highly skilled migrants, such as our professional nurses. No? They're probably foreign spouses, holders of foreign spouse visa or dependents of a, of a national in that country, or a child and other family member sort of categorization according to the visa um, rules no, of the destination country. Next slide. 
So the context of reception explains the gendered nature of transnational mothering. No? So it helps to provide the background information about the Filipino women I've been studying no? over the last 12 years. No? In Japan, most of our women came in as foreign spouse, no? as marriage migrants, and entertainers back in the 1970s and 80s, the peak of which, the peak of entry of our Filipino women there um, in, in Japan. Many of them gained access to legal status and residency rights through marriage and having children. And in short, they are both productive and reproductive laborers demanded by this rapidly aging society. Long-term and permanent resident status permitted settlement of many of them to Japan, which is contrary to the temporary migrant uh, workers no, who get the so-called designated activity visa. So this is the type of visa that is given to house helpers working for expat families or even those working for Japanese families, no, affluent ones, um, who were able to hire a house helper by virtue of the bilateral agreement between Japan and the Philippines back in 2018. No? Um, so they cannot bring their families no, and live with their families in Japan. So that's the set of, sort of distinction no, to the um, unequal access to uh, legal status and residency um, among Filipino women in Japan. So 20% uh, of Filipinos in Japan can be found in Kanto region where Tokyo and its immediate environs are located. No? So the likes of uh, Kanagawa, Chiba, and Saitama, as you can see here in the map. Um, so, um, of the 282,000, no, almost 282,000 Filipinos residing in Japan, um, more than half of this number already have been permanent and long-term residents um, in the country. So, meaning they have the tendency to be settled, no, more, a more settled, stable status no, of uh, residence and, and work and family life no, in the country. Next slide. Thank you. The next set of slides will illustrate the kind of transnational mothering that Filipino women engage in in Japan. And I use the case of Timog Forum and Malago Forum, two important online communities uh, that shape no, the transnationality of, of the mothering practices of the women I'm looking and I'm studying. Um, so first is the Timog Forum, which is founded in 2004 no, by a group of Filipino students, uh, presumably uh, government scholars, no? engineer and IT majors who developed this online site uh, and considered the oldest community of Filipino migrants um, in, in Japan. No? So, um, and here, uh, when, when the Timog Forum existed, actually when I arrived in Japan as a, as a student no, back in 2009, I immediately became a member of this site. So I followed um, um, religiously uh, the, the forum posts and some important announcements that are not just relevant to Japan but also to the Philippines. And the existence of Timog Forum complemented the print media um, like the likes of Jeepney Press and all other Filipino-owned magazines no, that have been produced um, and, and promoting various products, no, companies in, in, uh, in Japan that were also uh, co-owned by Filipinos and, and their Japanese houses. So Timog Forum served as a one-stop online support site which creates uh, multiple venues for addressing everyday life concerns of our kababayans no, in Japan. And it's membership-based, so you, meaning you have to register uh, to have an account so that you can enter the site. No? But because it's very flexible and, and very inclusive, no, it did not it, it included membership of Filipinos who do not necessarily live in Japan and might be interested, no, especially those based in the Philippines and have some concerns that maybe affect future plans of going to Japan, etc. Okay, um, so Timog Forum uh, as an online community validates new ideals of good motherhood. Um, next slide, please. And you can see it from some of the forum posts, no, topics that I all followed also. At the time when I was writing this paper, I was really interested on how the site facilitates discussions on what good motherhood really is no, from the vantage point and experiences of our kababayans. No? So such as this uh, post no, titled, Ano ba ang bataya ng pagiging dakilang ina? What is the true measure of being a great mother? And... Um, so when I follow the thread, no, it's too bad that I don't have a snapshot no, of the thread, but the thread really talks about how good mothers are defined as providers, as breadwinners. No? 
Um, so the site validates new ideals of good motherhood. No, it's uh, a good mother no longer stays at home. A good mother is a provider. So the idea that mothers uh, can provide, no, challenge the notion that only the fathers are the pillars of the home. And at times, uh, to, due to circumstances such as single parenthood, no, uh, migrant mothers embrace breadwinning as both maternal and paternal roles. So, such as the exchanges not highlighted here, uh, some points from Tero Katsu and Angelou, uh, which really highlighted how they explain you know, what breadwinning is all about you know, from their perspective. Next slide, please. So, if the previous slide valorizes breadwinning as a measure of good motherhood, there are also posts that point to the contradictory outcomes of sending remittances, you No, know? that is, economic violence no when remittances are misappropriated or mismanaged by left behind family which happens to a lot of migrant uh, migrant uh, filipinos no this is uh, being uh, discussed as well no in the forum no one of the bits here titled um bakit kaya pamilya ko sa pilipinas i wonder why yeah my family in the philippines where talk about where they talk about defining good motherhood as being able to or being capable of disciplining one's left behind family no not allowing economic violence to persist no because it affects na the well-being of mothers of women working very hard no in in the receiving country and then learning about all the piling up of debts and other you know uh money related problems back home no so here they idealize yeah, that a good mother is a, a provider but also a disciplinarian no uh so incidentally around this, this time 2010s i think uh where the government our government um initiated some financial literacy uh, financial literacy uh, programs no, to left behind families, various institutions, I think, not just, uh, I think CFO, not just uh, the Philippine government, but also lo local government unit and NGOs, migrant NGOs um, here in the Philippines have uh, something similar initiatives no, um, to address the issue no, of economic violence and to better, you know, for left behind families to better budget no, remittances. But although, you know, in my current research, no, I still see encounter narratives of economic abuse from time to time, especially during the height of the pandemic, where a lot of uh, our uh, women no, struggled to um, um, send money, you know, of the same amount as, as the previous um, occasions. Um, next slide, please. So the other online community site that I want to uh, examine here and present with you is uh, the case of the Malago Forum, no, which uh, was founded in 2010, no, about the same time the Timog Forum was already operating. Although some of the members of the Malago Forum were also uh, also had accounts at Timog Forum, no, before its collapse in 2012. Striver, an IT engineer, that's his, uh, his pseudonym, Striver, Sir Striver, whom I interviewed. I actually interviewed the, the administrators of the Malago uh, Forum personally. So I got the signal no, to uh, share some of these uh, data no, about the site no, um, for research purposes. Um, he's an IT engineer, so he's the only male in the team. And the team of administrators, in fact, consists of Filipino women who are permanent residents now in Japan. And they were raising children around uh, Tokyo. One of them is a Kapampangan who suggested the name of the site no, to mean beautiful. No? Malago means beautiful. As most of them are mothers, it's common for them to assist other mothers struggling to lead a family due to language and cultural barriers. No? These are pr prominent no, constraining factors, I think, when leading a family or marriage in Japan. No? The language and cultural barriers are real. Over the years, the Malago Forum has shifted no, and has multiplied its portal for assisting Filipino migrants no, in distress. Next slide, please, as I show you. So the Malago Forum humbly site, just like the Timog Forum as an online community site, as you can see here in the photos, forgive me, it's a little bit ano, blurred no, images, but I've kept them in the past. Um, so in 2007, 2010, no, they already have this uh, full-blown by 2010. No, so that when you um, uh, become a member, no, so you have to log on with the username and password. No, you have to register and then you will have this account so you can access the online site. No. Um, next slide. 
So by around 2016, when I was doing this research about the case of Malago Forum, I learned how the, the, the site has transitioned to Facebook. So they already have a Facebook page. And as you can see, these are some of the um, posts no, that are visible no, on the Facebook page of the Malago Forum. But the nature is the same. The purpose is to share and, and uh, circulate information for uh, useful no, for daily living in Japan. Uh, a lot of which has to do with uh, how to file a visa, no, what are the requirements when you want to invite um, a family member, etc. Et um, next slide, please. By 2020, at the height of the pandemic, Malago Forum um, moved to the YouTube channel. They had a YouTube channel. And uh, as you can see also on the upper right, they also have an Instagram and Twitter account. So search Striver, I think, envisioned this as early as 2017, that they would really expand you know, the, the portals you know, for disseminating information to reach the Filipino migrants, not just in Japan, but around the world. So that's the beauty of internet um, and, and communication technologies now. It deterioralizes no? access to information. And wherever you are, whatever, whichever part of the world, you're able to uh, learn no? uh, some useful information no? to navigate uh, the life, uh, the systems, no? in, in, uh, particularly in Japan. No? Um, next slide, please. So as you can see here, I highlighted some episodes no, on their YouTube channel. And these are some of the episodes, no, the, the uploads that are particularly relevant no, uh, when raising a family no, in Japan. No? So such, such as information about visa application, no, what are the current rules, what are the childcare benefits no, that migrant mothers can apply for, or uh, whether they are, you know, what are the conditions of eligibility or, you know, those things. Child care allowances, which are provided by the government, no? Um, and then there's new financial assistance, especially during the pandemic that the Japanese government has been one of, if not the most generous when it comes to assisting Filipinos, all kind, all migrants, including tourists, no? provided they stayed in Japan for minimum of three months um, and they're stuck there, they were given monetary assistance. No? Um, there's, yeah, some social cultural um, discussions. No? Like, for example, in Japan, there's a... Um, coming of age no um how when do you know what age is considered adult no um in japan so i think this is important especially it has implications on voting rights no employment etc cetera, et cetera. so all of these i think episodes have been very useful i think if accessed by any filipino who would like to know and the best part is even if it's in uh, you can see it's in taglish no and I think in one of the memorable conversations I had with Sir Striver, no, he talked about how intimidating uh, Facebook pages of the Philippine Embassy, embassy can, can be because it's in English, even the website, no, which makes it uh, you know, um, intimidating for a lot of Filipinos to seek help no, online um, from the Philippine Embassy, from the government agencies no, because of the language. So this is something that he addressed through this uh, through the portals no, uh, created by the Malago Forum. So uh, next slide, please. So even though there's already, you know, crossing, crossing over to various portals no, by the Malago Forum over the years, the traditional online site is still alive, no? It just says, it's funny, it says Malago is temporarily closed. But according to Sir Striver, um, it's still in operation. Um, one of the, the reasons the Timog Forum collapsed was the IT engineers, administrators were not able to manage the member flood, flooding of membership and uh, not able to regulate the maintenance uh, period. So I think he had to do some kind of scheduling uh, to make sure that the website is well maintained or it does not collapse, it does not suffer just like what happened to the Timog Forum. So he does something like this, like maintenance advisory kind of, uh, you know, notice. Um, but if you can see here, some of the samples of the post, no, paano ba mag-report ng imitation kikon or imitation marriage? If you're in the Philippines, how do you report that? What's the, there's a concern about divorce. Uh, what information do you uh, need for employment? employment like are these companies legit like somebody would like to know and there is always somebody it's not always it's not always the administrators who provide um answers but there are other members active members 
equally helpful no, in the site. Um, next slide, please. So these issues uh, and challenges no, um, over the years, no, despite this advancement, no, transformation in the online uh, uh, community sites, no, that is what happened to uh, the Malago Forum, one thing is the same, no? issues and challenges, uh, there are still issues and challenges that are enduring um, and reflective of the uh, current realities of no? Filipino migrant mothers in Japan. So um, I'm not going to, this is just an example no? of, of some of the postings no? on, on the Malago Forum inside no? the community site. But some of these issues uh, still resonate no, to this day uh, with the Filipino migrant women's lives elsewhere, no, outside beyond Japan. So such as the issue of family reunification, no, the process that involves uh, that. Um, in Japan, there are cases where Japanese fathers, quote unquote, abandon their children in the Philippines and they're looking for ways on how they contact or reach out these fathers. Nationality law is tied to family registration or koseki system. No, that's uh, in Japan. In order to be recognized, gain access to say inheritance and other rights, no, you need to be registered to the koseki or regis family registry of your father, no, of of uh, the the patriarch, no. So, um, and it formalizes acceptance of children into uh, the Japanese fam side of the family. And that's important as implications because that's social and legal implications and not a lot of Filipinos are familiar with the, with the law. Fourth is the legal and social challenges affecting Filipino mothers who are living as single parents. No? Because a lot of Filipino mothers who are single parents think they lose many of their social rights because of the failure of their marriage. So they have very limited knowledge of what are their family-related rights. Next slide, please. So to summarize, these are the major issues and concerns that are very frequently posted um, on the various portals of the Malago Forum, no? uh, where uh, single mother, uh, the issues of uh, marriage no? uh, and single parenthood, no? uh, mothers, uh, uh, sorry, those who are married experience domestic abuse. They want out. No, where the shelters? Those experiencing isolation despite being married. No, how to help them? Uh, despite being, uh, you know, away, very distant, away from the city. What are the legal processes? No, like I've shown you of divorce or even getting married or remarriage. Um, the issue of childcare, which affects single parents. Third, family obligation, especially in the Philippines, which according to Sir Striver, is one of the leading causes of distress among Filipinos in Japan. I think elsewhere as well. Um, and then the health and well-being, because there have been uh, a lot of sharings about their physical and mental health issues online. The good thing about online sites is anonymity. No, You don't have to disclose who you are, and that prevents some kind of judgmental maybe some kind of ano, interpret misinterpretation about your case. So there's anonymity as well in addressing the issues and more generalistic in approach. No? Um, and I think uh, the administrators also disclose how it's becoming more and more rampant for Filipinos to experience physical and mental health challenges over there, especially that there are many of our uh, women are aging no, in, in Japan. Remember, some of them came as early as 70s, 80s. So you can just imagine, no, they're probably no longer uh, raising children as their main issue, but they still face some of the, um, you know, um, issues, health-related issues no, that uh, really constrain no, uh, their well-being no, in Japan. Now, doing community here, no? So, um, um, online, no? Regularizes interactions of personal struggles, no? Um, that, that, that's one of the benefits, I think, of online community because, you know, real time, wherever you are, you can always have somebody to talk to, ask for advice, get support, no? How to improve family relations. You have family relations, you have marriage and family life in Japan, but you also have left behind family members, uh, you know, to look after and think about back here in the Philippines. Childcare, access to various services. How do you complement the services and information available in receiving country and also in the Philippines? A lot of my respondents are less familiar already you know, because they have been away in, from the Philippines for so long. They're already less familiar with the service information that are um, you know, useful for them, you know, especially if they have plans to return eventually to the Philippines. Um, 
the online community sites have provided have been sources of moral and emotional care no um the moderators who are mostly mothers uh serve as moral interlocutors like they know they can tell whether some of the uh, members are lying or maybe uh, sharing a narrative that's their own or friends or friends or something that uh, maybe they have some plans to like um, um, violate no some some rules no some policies of the government so they know which of which of the uh, members need genuine help. Uh, and so they become in the process become middling mothers no uh, the, the concept term uh, the, the term used by uh, VZ Williams in his in her own study next uh, research uh, next slide sorry next slide yeah um so um the malago forum is a case of uh, an online site that provides a service as a network of care no it complements offline community especially that a lot of uh, filipinos have not been able to go to church and the church is the core of filipino sociality in japan as in around the world right uh filipinos congregate around church um and so because it has been a lot of the activities church related activities um temporarily stopped during the pandemic it was very uh i think uh very helpful that there are online sites like the malago forum you know uh, uh, that uh, continue to provide assistance to our kababayans no um especially the the height of their distress uh, related to the pandemic one thing is important to also emphasize here is how intra-ethnic trust and cooperation is being instilled no within the community of course there's preference to help to help out our kababayans but I think the website also disclosed how they have been able to connect our uh, Filipinos not to other migrants because of the 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 all the in, kinds of information that they share are not just useful for our fellow Filipinos but also to other migrant groups. So um, they have been able to uh, provide uh, foster inter ethnic trust and cooperation, but also intra because um, it brings it brings uh they bring no our fellow filipinos closer to authorities no not to be afraid to the authorities if you know what are the laws the policies the rights no you cannot be abused or discriminated so i think that's that really is an important foundation why the sites have been still in operation and in fact in my recent interviews malago forum was mentioned by most of my respondents in terms of accessing health and social related information so they give greater primacy. However, there's a downside, no? there's a tendency to pull the, the discourse around family of Malago Forum is quite conflicting because they want our fellow Filipino women to uh Filipino women to focus on their family in Japan because there's a tendency to have like an imbalance in managing the two families. No, um, they tend to be preoccupied with sending remittances back home, no, but they tend to also forget, neglect the children or their husband by their side so that that kind of discourse also appeared in the conversations i had with the administrators next slide so i i just want to um uh, i think i'm down to my last two slides now but i just want to highlight this quote from beth one of the administrators no uh, a mother of three and uh, i met her uh for my uh, ma thesis but i think uh, i also got to interview several times no especially about the malago forum and she find it really fulfilling that she was able to uh provide support no for other to other distressed filipino mothers it has been a fulfilling commitment on her part and over the years the goal is uh to survive all filipinos should be able to survive you know the very difficult and ever changing policy uh you know uh programs the, the systems in general no? the health social systems no of a foreign country and and um and so that that really makes her uh um um fulfilled somewhat um to be able to do this kind of mission and it's for free um to end i'd like to go to my last slide no i wish to highlight several points so um in this presentation no i i mentioned how transnational mothering has emerged out of the necessities to sustain family across borders it also sprang out of the global wide crisis no, of care and it has evolved with the advent of the digital communication technologies which also its affordances were uh, maximized by our filipino mothers no um, here and abroad 
Filipinos' practice of transnational mothering has enabled them to reconstruct notions of good motherhood and family. No one that has to be disciplined in terms of resource allo allocation and utilization, but also reinforce gender division of labor in, in family. So this, I think, raises the question no, uh, that uh, maintenance of family life and family relations still falls on the lap of, of laps of our women. No? So does that give them a second shift? I would say to some degree, it still remains in the hands of them. No? Parenas also um, sort of affirmed this in her own studies, no? saying that women, despite the migration of women, which somewhat empowered them monetarily, no? economically speaking, no? it has not changed the uh, gender division of labor. Women is still in charge of looking after the well-being of the family as a whole. The more collective communal nature of transnational mothering in recent years no, um, suggests that family life in the digital age is challenging the dichotomous, you know, the divide, the, the very used to be um, uh, rigid divide between public and private or intimate. And then lastly, as a policy implication, I think uh, the fact that there are some of our concerned agencies here in the audience, thank you very much, I want to look into the fact that our migrants, uh, mothers, and perhaps fathers as well, need more technologies and platforms you know, to promote health and social and legal literacy of our uh, fellow Filipinos abroad. Um, and that will be beneficial, not just for the Philippines, but also to the receiving uh, countries. No? So let's make our migrant mothers, let's empower them by, make, by yeah, helping them become health, social, and legally literate. So this I end my presentation. That's my last slide. Thank you very much. Um, I think I have my thank you slide on the end. Maraming salamat po sa inyong pakikinig. And I'm very much uh, looking forward to questions and comments from the audience. Domo, arigato gozaimashita. Thank you very much, Dr. Jo. There are so many important threads in that presentation. And I think one, one thing that's really um, striking is how child rearing, caregiving, it involves a lot of emotional labor that often falls to women, as you said. But one other dimension that you added is that the proliferation of digital technologies, sometimes the emotional labor involved in moderating that also now falls to women. No? I hope we can explore those threads further later in the Q&A. So this is a good chance to remind our audience members that if you have any questions or comments, kindly um, type the same and use the Q&A button to, to put your questions in. No, and, and we really hope to to hear insights from from our audience because like, like we said, we know that you come from uh, you have very practical experience as well in uh, migration labor migration governance. So um, for our next presenter, as we have seen that the challenges um, inherent in caregiving, it finds parallel in a way in the work that our nurses do abroad, but also in the ecosystem services that our planet provides for us, benefits that are jeopardized by the ongoing climate and environmental crisis that we were reminded of again this weekend with um, Typhoon Carding. No? Our third and final speaker will be walking us through these interrelationships, having done research on human migration, disasters, and extreme events through creative qualitative research in the framework of care ethics and geographies and decolonial thought. A research associate at Hamburg University in Germany, she's part of the research group Climate, Climatic Change, and Society, Conflict and Cooperation at the Climate Security Nexus. She has kindly recorded her presentation for us because she's currently in New York where it's the wee hours of the morning and she's staying in an Airbnb with thin walls. So she doesn't want to cause a major disturbance in, in um, the apartment that she's renting. So she has pre-recorded pre her presentation, but she will join us later for the Q&A. So please um, have your questions ready. So may I now invite Dr. Cleovi Mosmela. Dr. Cleovi, please. I think um, 
do we have the sound? Um, could we kindly check on the sound, please? I think we need to restart the presentation with uh, the audio, please. I can also try to share from my side. All right, so I think we're having a bit of a technical glitch there. Um, I'm also not able to share with the sound. Our friends for, from UP Sufal, we will have better luck sharing with uh, the sound. Can we try again? And um, if we're not able to, we can see. My name is Korea Venezuela. I'm a research associate at Humber University. Mm -hmm. Let's see again. Is it um, working now or, or not yet? I tried. Okay, I'm going to try this one more time. Yeah, okay. This is... Sorry about that. Maybe in the meantime, do we have questions for um, Dr. Celero while we're trying to sort out this, this issue? Q&A, yeah, we have a question. So it says here, I am particularly curious about whether the Malago Forum or Timog Forum were also used in migrant organizing, aside from being a network of care. I wonder if it has also served as a platform in advocating for migration policies and our services. Dr. Jo, please. I think that, um, <laughs> how do I say this? Okay, Malago Forum fills in what they say, what the Philippine Embassy should be doing. And it's like to provide like a 24 hour kind of service um, to uh, Filipinos in Japan. No? So the good thing about the online community site is they're, they're able to, um, you know, answer. Of course, not sometimes not real time because some of them work, but there's always an answer. Like every time something is posted there, no, so I've shown you. Um, so, so far as working with the Philippine government, I think the Malago Forum has not done that, but they're not saying they're anti-Philippine government. They would want to work with them, but I think that... Um, there's a they have different ways of looking at how to help Filipinos. <laughs> um, there's a long, I think we can have a long discussion on this now because um, it's like um, so far what the Malago Forum is doing is they bring our migrants closer to the receiving country's government no? because they're the ones who provide you know more services more policies that directly affect their lives no even our contract based maybe migrant workers even technical interns no there's a technical internship program in japan but even these that are supposedly being given maybe a priority i think for the philippine government no in terms of assistance they also get less 
I wouldn't say the Philippine government, Philippine embassy is not doing anything at all no, to address their cause. But I think that the bridging, the more collaborative potential, I think is not yet there. Um, because I think the Malago Forum side, siding more of the migrants um, and, and a lot of these are complaints, sentiments against the embassy and the Philippine government. So I think there really is this gap but I would say also that the Malago Forum administration is not saying they're anti-Philippine government. They also, in their ways, um, bring some of our policies. In fact, even news in the Philippines also are being posted in the page. So it's not that they are being, being ano, be, it's like they're reinforcing the, the hate or, or the dislike no, towards, uh, ano, against the government. But it's like that they are doing something that they think what what is more needed more immediate i think so migrant organizing maybe is not yet in the picture is not yet in the vision no, of the malago forum but i think that would happen if the the uh the gap will be bridged i think if if the embassy i think the forum administrators administrators if i recall correctly tried to approach the embassy but they did not get favorable response, I think, in terms of, you know, outlining the nature of collaboration, in what ways the government, you know, can also maximize what they're doing on the ground. So, yeah, um, mm -hmm. it's going to take some more push, I think. All right. Yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Dr. Joe, no? Um, yeah, and I think that we can continue the discussion as well later. I think the sound is, is okay now, so we'll try again. So, thank you for being here. Um, you are watching a recording of my presentation because of time difference, and I'm not really sure of the inter internet connection as well. Um, but I'm very happy to have this opportunity to contribute to the conversation around feminist labor migration policy and ambition natin 2040. A little bit of information about me. My research projects are not merely an object of study for me, but are also a reflection of my own experience as a Filipina migrant who maintains caring relations across distance. I position myself in the tradition of women of color and post-colonial scholars who reflect on their own experience and subjectivities, which influence the way of conducting scientific research. My contribution to the conversation today and hopefully it is something that we can carry on from here, is thinking about the intersections of care and international labor migration. I will draw on my past and current research that focuses on migrant agency. This means migrants as bearers of different kinds of experience, capacities and potentialities. I argue that the transnationality of migrants' lives bears witness to the displacement violence, marginalization, and harm that transpire when inherent vulnerabilities are exacerbated by unjust and inhumane social political relations. Some of my research questions revolve around how migrants navigate different intersecting temporal and spatial scales, from the personal to the social body of the immigrant communities to the national bodies of their host and home countries, from personal memories to the larger narratives of colonization, extraction, to possible and poss plausible futures. How do we make sure that Ambition 1940 and the feminist labor migration policy are aligned? Reading the documents produced by the National Economic and Development Authority, or NEDA, part of the vision of Filipinos for 2040 is having reduced vulnerabilities and living in safe and secure communities. Emmanuel F. Esguera, the Social Economic Planning Secretary and Director General, said in one of the videos produced that, the quote, the government has a critical role to play in supporting the realization of these aspirations, end of quote. Mr. Esguera listed general things on how the government could support its people. 
But for our discussion here, I'll specify on one, that the government should be investing in people and protecting people against instability. This opens the space to think about and determine where instabilities happen. This opens to thinking about feminist labor migration policy and recognizing how caring relations are marginalized, especially when practiced across unequal territorial borders. How do these caring relations play out in terms of in times of extreme events? such as the COVID-19 pandemic and natural disasters to which the Philippines is not immune. I think more than ever, it is high time we talked about the centrality of care in our lives, the corporeality of care and its gendered underpinnings, especially in the lives of Filipino migrant workers. So the first avenue would be looking at care and the international migration of Philippine trained healthcare workers. I'll talk about the results of interviews conducted on the experience of Filipino nurses in German COVID-19 stations at the beginning of the pandemic. The second possibility is the merging of care crises and climate crisis as experienced by Filipino migrants. Caring in the context of nursing in the Philippines has been essentialized, even institutionalized through the image of a professional nurse being promoted overseas. Sociologists and US-based Filipino scholars like Ana Romina Gavara and Robin Rodriguez expose a labor brokerage brokering mechanism enabled by the Philippine state very much embedded in its colonial history particularly as related to the United States colonial labor system, which laid out the blueprint for generating a kind of labor export economy as an expression of managing the population of the Philippines. This export for Filipino nurses has been contributing to the problems in the Philippine healthcare system. For instance, nurses are overburdened with patients. Paradoxically, there are hundreds of thousands of unemployed nurses, there are not many positions open in hospitals, and the salaries are below the family living wage. The literature would call these drivers of migration. I and a colleague conducted interviews with Filipino nurses working on the front lines of COVID-19 care stations in German hospitals and who migrated through a bilateral agreement between the Philippines and Germany enacted in 2013. The main idea behind that agreement is to fill Germany's nursing shortage and that nurse migration is beneficial for the nurses themselves. But in my previous research, I've argued that nurse migration from under-resourced to developed countries perpetuates the dispensability of care and the expendability of nurses on a global scale. And the pandemic manifests the flaws of the system. Our research results open up discussions about what it means to care for those who are on the front lines of COVID-19 care. Filipino nurses experienced heightened precariousness at COVID-19 stations. Coronavirus is a moment of rupture that creates new worlds of uncertainty. Given that nurses are responsible for primary care of patients, which means feeding, bathing, and helping patients move, and there is a lot of physical contact, they are nervous taking on the job, knowing that what they are facing is new and fatal. They have corporeal experience of the intensity of the pandemic, of the virus. They ask themselves a lot of what ifs. What if I get infected? What if I unknowingly pass it on? Which kept one nurse awake for five straight nights? Is it a blessing to be a nurse during the pandemic? What if I die? But maybe it is better to die doing what you're supposed to do. As a caring profession, health workers are therefore particularly versed in creating and practicing a broader view of care and illuminating the potential strength of the sector. 
Care expresses relationships. It is an expression of support as when the government provides support for those who need care. And it is also a burden. The burden of helping to maintain and preserve the political institutions and the community. And beyond the profession, care narrates the relational ontology of human beings, which emphasizes that individuals are embedded in a complex personal and social web of care. It regards people being situated synchronically in different care relationships, being at the same time caregiver and care receiver. Now I'm moving on to the second scenario, which is the experience of the merging of care crisis and the climate crisis. I conducted research with an environmental scientist, Denise Margaret Matthias, who is also based in Germany. We published a book chapter in 2015 and a working paper in 2016. We could provide electronic copies of them if you wish. So in that research, we analyzed how existing transnational migrant networks address the demands at the onset of extreme events, such as the typh such as Typhoon Haiyan or Yolanda in 2013. Specifically, we examined uh, the Filipino diaspora and their network from different parts of the world who actively raised resources and awareness for those affected by Typhoon Haiyan. Apart from highlighting the interaction between climate change and extreme events, our findings suggest intricate connections between care transferred and practiced across borders and the vulnerability of the Philippine islands with the frequency of extreme events observed from 1990. These interconnections, as they become more severe in the light of everyday practices and adaptive responses to climatic state stress, require critical analysis in drafting careful climate policies. Or policies in general, such as feminist migration labor policy. When Typhoon Haiyan ravaged the Visayas region of the Philippines on 8th November 2013, 141 organizations in the United States, plus members of the Congress and the Senate, requested the Department of Homeland Security for a temporary protected status designation for the Philippines as it struggles to address significant loss of life restore infrastructure and provide adequate and timely assistance to affected millions. Almost a year after the extreme event, one Filipino domestic worker in New York laments, quote, my house until now has no roof. Everything was gone. The interior is all ruined. My brother's livelihood, he used to have a piggery. Now it's all washed. Now I have to start from scratch. That's why I would like to request from the U.S. government to grant us this temporary protected status so I can work with no fear." End of quote. She was reported saying this during the People's Climate March on um, September 2014 in New York City. She was 70 at that time um, and had been working for 20 years in American households and was looking forward to retirement. Temporary protected status is a blanket relief for foreign nationals already residing in the U.S. at the time of calamity who may not meet the legal definition of refugee but would nevertheless face perilous situations if to return to their countries of citizenship. TPS recipients receive temporary permission to live and work and reprieve from deportation for a period of 6 to 18 months. TPS was not granted to the Philippines despite a bill introduced in the 113th Congress and the Senate's note that Filipino nationals will not pose any danger to national security. TPS would have meant a lifeline for Filipino undocumented workers to continue giving support to their families back home impacted by Haiyan. Some Filipino migrants occupy a position of legal, social, and economic marginalization as a non-citizen and or undocumented in the United States in this case. 
These migrant workers mobilize care for themselves and for their distant loved ones and enable disaster response and recovery. Their act of care is intertwined with or embedded within an equal power relations. They make claims on the embodied experiences of climate change intertwined with an extractive economy. I'm going to conclude with a statement that through Filipino migrants' position of bearing witness to climate and social injustices, they envision a world in which their families and communities in the Philippines are not left behind and that they are living in safe and secure communities to refer back to Ambition Natin 2014. I'm going to leave you with a quote from the Center for Feminist Foreign Policy that reminds us of the importance of highlighting women's and marginalized groups' experiences and agency for us to live better lives. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to join the Q&A session later. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Masuela. I'm glad we were able to make that work because there's a lot for us to unpack there in your presentation, I think. We were we actually invited the German ambassador, Ambassador Anke Reifenstuhl, to join us. And she was trying to join us earlier. Unfortunately, she was facing a lot of um, technical problems. So what they are going to do instead is they're going to send us their presentation and we will circulate it to the email addresses that our audience members used to register, which I think gives us more time actually for the Q&A. So I would like to invite Dr. Celero and Dr. Mesuela to join us again. Uh, we do have some questions um, in the thread, mainly related to the one that was asked earlier. But I also wanted to ask um, Dr. Cleovi and Dr. Jo, um, with a presentation of, um, th with the last presentation, we saw how, you know, one of the benefits being used to promote the transition to cleaner technologies to cleaner energy, renewable energy, for example, right now, is that it will create new jobs. But unless we change the unequal power relations that and the structural problems that you mentioned, um, Dr. Mosuela, then there is the risk that we will simply replicate a lot of the problems that we see right now in the labor migration space in this new green economy. For example, we read about workers being employed to do rebuilding in disaster struck areas, and that sometimes they do not really get proper benefits. They don't get enough equipment to secure their safety. And also, um, because Dr. Celero, you've done your work in Japan, recently I came across this TikTok videos of seasonal agricultural workers in Japan, Filipino, young Filipinos going to Japan to do difficult agricultural work, which is becoming more difficult because of, you know, the warming, uh, the, the heating planet and all that. So what are your thoughts on this? Um, what do you think this will mean for migrant workers and for the labor migration space? I don't know who wants to begin. Um, maybe Dr. Jo, you want to, to start? Um, you know, the plight of uh, technical interns and uh, there's a new scheme, uh, specified skilled visa uh, workers you know, who get recruited you not know, to work at the farms, you no know, shipyards, etc. Um, has been, um, I think the government has been trying to streamline the uh, the conditions, you no, know, uh, um like pre-departure and also post-arrival, making sure that, uh, I have a colleague who's working on this, no? making sure that there's an open line of communication between the, uh, the Philippine government, the recruiters and the employers no? and all that, making sure that if there are any 
um, irregularities no in the contracts let's say they get exploited in the actual workplace uh, scenario no that they they know who to talk to or who to turn to no for for um, assistance and uh, i was able to confirm this i think in some of my respondents who were able to um, communicate no the abuses i think they were overworked and that uh, at the farm uh, and uh, they were the other the other one was in the factory and then they were able to um, communicate no these abuses and i think it was settled you know amicably i think they were able to get their overtime pay etc so i think that educate equipping our workers you know, our migrants with uh, all the necessary preparations prior and also uh, knowing who are the agents that they could directly contact you now for support i think those are very important um guarantees you no know, that they will have a safe and secure uh, you know conditions uh working conditions you no know, in, in the destination country um and this has been proven so far although because of the pandemic there was an overwhelming number also of abuses and um i think incidents that they uh, some of our workers suddenly left um not just because the conditions have not been parang environment is totally safe or ano, but also because um some promises were broken i think in the contract a lot of contract related the exploitation so far no um because i don't i have not heard stories so far i don't i don't also focus on this i can only base my observations on what i have uh learn from my respondents my own respondents but that's not everything no there were also expressions of uh yeah, liking and appreciating working at the farm in japan better than say in the philippines because the support is there and i think that they um there are people who appreciate this kind of work so it's not that it's inhumane at, in all cases not all times um but during the pandemic those who experienced some kind of miscommunication irregularities in their contract like that even though they love their work but because some forms of assistance uh, they were deprived of no uh, during the pandemic um because it's different the, the the support that they're getting from the national government is different from their employer so if there's some kind of irregularity there like that our our workers are smart enough to run away or like seek support elsewhere <laughs> i go back to my previous answer the previous question <laughs> the philippine embassy is not one of the first <laughs> agencies or, or or you know institutions they run to <laughs> but other fellow filipinos long residing in the country like like that um uh, church leaders for example they're the ones that provide immediate response so um i think that if uh if there be any if there's anything worth uh you know uh, any change worth noting at in the current uh, flow i think of our migrant workers now and because of the improvement i think also especially in the the communication the communication channels now than before um our workers are more vigilant now than ever uh unlike before it was very difficult i think to 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 express for example yeah exploitations or some you know inhumane conditions at work like that um so i feel that there is just so much more to do on the part of our government philippine government to keep that line of communication open so that our workers will trust or be more comfortable to reach out to them because at the moment the narratives i still get in my recent fellowship is that the government the embassy representing the government no overseas i think it's still not that friendly or supportive to our okay. migrants we'll continue <laughs> that that point later in the meantime yeah. may i ask uh, your inputs as well uh, dr masuela hi yes um can you hear me well yes <laughs> my voice is a little weird it's the early morning so um, I think Kathy, um, you raised a, a very um, timely question. Um, so I am here in 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 New York, um, and I was um, visiting uh, because of the climate week. So it was um, last week, um, and and a lot of the discussion 
revolves around decarbonization and as you said you know the the transition to the green economy and um interestingly there was only one event um organized uh, by the lutheran church um and it was about the um connections between agriculture and immigration um in general, so I'm um, not talking specifically about the, the Philippines, but this is um, in general, um, but of, unfortunately it was canceled. But my point is that, um, um, and I have talked to um, several um, migrant organizations, grassroots organizations, not necessarily from the Philippines, but um, migrant organizations, um, which are um, really foregrounding migrant justice. And they are, um, you know, trying to voice um, and trying to have a seat at the table. This is their words, to have a seat at the table where the conversation happen, where conversations happen um, and where they can really um, um, talk about the injustices that they experience. Because um, as we transition to the green economy, um, the point is, um, we need to foreground uh, migrant migrant voices and the concerns of the migrants themselves, and not to forget um, that it is not just about the environment, but it is also about the social um, the social implications and social justice. And so, um, it is really important to know the kind of the position that they're having. Maybe they're undocumented, or maybe. Um, they have, for instance, in agriculture or in dairy farming, they they work twelve hours. Um, um, they don't get, for instance, um, um, vacation, um, and so um, it's really kind of important for um, migrants to organize um, um, as part of um, um, and and not just uh, as, as part of like protecting their own. Um, um, protecting their own concerns and, and really raising their voice. So yeah, that that's my take to the question. All right. Thank you very much. And I think um, to relate to what Dr. Jo shared in her presentation, digital technologies are one potential tool for, to do such organizing. I mentioned the TikTok videos that I showed. I know there are also some popular TikTok um, TikTokers, for example, who talk about the experience of being a nurse overseas and the challenges that they face. I guess the challenge would be, how do we use these tools precisely to make this, to achieve these objectives? Because we could very well also just use these tools to distract ourselves, right? We just keep scrolling, looking at, you know, cat photos, cat memes, get a lot of flack for, for that. But how do we use this? Um, tools to strengthen solidarity and organizing. I, I think um, regarding your point um, earlier, Dr. Joe, and this is not something that came from you, it was just your observation about some of our migrants still not really perceiving our government foreign service posts as being responsive to their needs, no? And and I think that, that falls into a, a long, narrative of some sort of combative or not really very, very good relations between migrants and, and authorities. And it would be interesting. I, I, it's uh, regrettable that USEC PY has left, but what she was referring to earlier is that the DMW at least will exert efforts so that government will have better relations with with migrants and to see them as actual partners. Would you have insights on how how do you think um, the, the government offices can make this happen? Apart from, I don't know, um, using social media better, aside from, you know, trying to do better PR, what what do you think they can they can do better? Um, Dr. Cleovi, this time, do you want to start? You might also have some insights on that, being a migrant yourself, as you mentioned. Sorry, um, Kathy, could you rephrase that? I was just um, reading yeah. the, the Q&A 
Oh some, yeah. Some questions no, about Q&A. I'm sorry. Right. No 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 problem. Yeah, you mentioned that uh you also shared your presentation not only as a scholar but as a migrant. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you'd have some thoughts about the the problem mentioned by Dr. Cho of uh, you know the not very good um relation sometimes between overseas Filipino communities and government offices like um Hmm. I'm not sure if this is something that, for example, you you yeah. worked with nurses. Did you get yeah. the same kind of feedback from them, or? Um. Yeah. That's uh, that's interesting. Um. I think it's because um the nurses that I've talked to are part of the um bilateral um agreement, and so um the position their position is is um very different um so it's kind of like an organized um an organized movement and so there is already a connection um um built you know from the time that they started applying um from you know from the time that they um uh that they were hired let's say um until the time that they started working. Um, so they, they've they always maintained connections. And I, I remember when we were, uh, when we had, when you organized um, a webinar um, at the, uh, when you were still at the, um, in, in Germany, Kathy, um, there were nurses, in fact, in the audience. Um, and I think some of them were, were really active um, in terms of, um, not just, um, you know, um, making themselves visible to other nurses, but also, um, I think they would want to be visible to the, um, Philippine embassy as well. Um, so they're, they they have that kind of, um, perhaps intimate connection as well. Um, well, I think that's, that's for the, um, nurses, um, who migrated through the bilateral agreement it might look different um, when you look at um, the nurses who migrated um, to Germany um, in the 1970s um, I don't have data on that but I've talked to some of them when I was still living in um, Bielefeld Germany um, and in that case um, they're kind of Germanized in a way they're kind of um if we can call it that way so um there's a there's a distance there's a, a big distance between them and um government offices in in Germany so they don't necessarily seek the help of um Philippine authorities but they'd rather go to um German authorities something like that so um i think it has also something to do with the language they have learned the language um and um, they speak the language frequently uh, fluently sorry and um and they're also um, maybe their affiliation and also the the change of the citizenship perhaps in a way that factors in so yeah those are those are those are just my thoughts and my observations at this point yeah if that answers the question Yes, I, I think it offers a lot of insight because referring to the nurses who came to, who went to Germany on a government to government arrangement. So I guess the mere fact that they went through the government track, no, they they do trust um, the government. So that sort of opens up avenues, and and um, I guess that offers insights as well for Dr. Cho for for what you mentioned, like. The challenge is how do we help these migrants who are mistrustful of these agencies to overcome that initial barrier? And when they do, it might just be possible to, you know, come to a more productive, more um, engaged relations with, with the embassy, for example. W would you agree with that, Dr. Jo? Yeah, I believe... It's only a matter of time, I think, that the government, the embassy representing the national government, I think, um, builds this bridge, not to communicate. I don't think the gov the embassy does have 
I don't think Mal- the Malago Forum administrators also would like to compete, I think, with the government in terms of assisting our migrants. So they both share the, the vision, the, the goal. No? So I think collaborating would be the best way if, you know, to maximize this uh, you know, um, technologies that we have developed, I think, in assisting our migrants. Um, I just wish no, that the embassy tries to reach out at all. I think the Malago Forum is just one of the several other portals that have been developed by Filipino migrants in Japan. I recall there's, there, there's like one or two that in fact received commendations from the Commission for Filipinos Overseas. I forgot the exact name of the site. But the fact that these technologies have been developed, I think, so to be able to um, provide assistance no, real time no, to our migrants, um, the, the embassy does not need to copy or like, you know, do something to sort of compete, uh, you know, in, in, with, with these initiatives in assisting our migrants. They can just collaborate and, and the embassy just have to reach out and make sure that all of these, um, you know, efforts are like with their support and with their sort of um, encouragement uh, rather than say, you know, maybe that these these govern these agencies or i mean this this um um sites no that have been you know operated by migrant residents are like distancing them further away from the government no right, but yes. then both sides have to find ways and how um they can work together in the field because that's right now it's not yet happening right. um so i don't okay. know also what the whether the government uh, has done so far to sort of cons- gather all of these online sites and say that they are our partners in in mm. you know helping our migrants you know have better lives no and manage lives i think in overseas yeah and and i it. yes and i would add that such an approach you know more cooperative, more, cooperative. more um you know, supporting each other would be in line with a more feminist approach as well. Right. And in relation to that, uh, we do have some a question from um, the audience. I think actually, um, yeah, Mr. Juan uh, Dayang, Jed, uh, he's one of actually our um, senior diplomats in, I'm not sure where, uh, in Ankara right now. So he's he is asking for the panelists looking at a feminist labor migration Looking through a feminist labor migration lens, what mm. would be your vision for labor migration? What may be some of the strategies that the government can pursue beyond the six-year term of Philippine administrations to achieve such a vision? So uh, may I ask first, mm. Dr. Kliovi? I think that's a very important question yes. and mm. also very difficult to answer. Yes. <laughs> but uh yeah we're here to to kind of um perhaps think about these things and so what we've what um Dr. Salero and I have done kind of um um open the discussion to um you know thinking about where um where injustices happen and where the problems lie um and so Dr. Salero already mentioned that it it um like one of the ways would be doing collaborative work. And I think there are um already um so for instance, best practices. Um so with a bilateral agreement, uh, and this is because this is what my my research, my research is, or my pre- my previous research was. And so that's what I'm that's why I'm talking about it at this point. Um so the German, the Philippine and German um, relations, um, the bilateral agreement, um, the hiring of nurses from the Philippines to Germany. Um, I one of the, I think one of the good things that came out of that agreement was, um, um, because it it was a tripartite basically, and so um, it it had the idea of an ethical recruitment. It also had the idea of a decent work, and it's also um, connected with the sustainable development goals um so the drafting of that po- of that agreement um was very much in line with the current um with the current labor standards let's say and so um 
when drafting that policy or when that when drafting that agreement, um, labor unions were consulted, not just in the Philippines, but also in Germany. So both sides, labor unions, professional organizations were consulted. And also through the monitoring process of, of that agreement, um, um, labor unions were also involved and also professional organizations um, in the monitoring and the implementation process. So I think that's one of the best practices. Um, um, and when it comes to, um, I, I, and I think that's probably what I meant with um, when I said earlier, the careful um, policy or mm. perhaps in climate policy or um, feminist labor migration policies in general. Um, it's like realizing that it's not just the individuals who are moving, but as Dr. Salera said, you know, it's a transnational parenting. So there are um, families involved and perhaps, um, you know, I think many of the concerns of the Filipino workers are reunification, for instance, because they're their productive years and they are separated from their families. So um, perhaps it might it might be a long shot, but you know, uh, but since we're talking about ambition not in 2040, um, having safe and secure community communities, you know, wherever it may be, whether it's um, in the Philippines or abroad, um, we make sure that you know families are together um, and. Um, yeah, I think th those are my thoughts at the moment. Yeah, and I, that, that also raises question ab questions about, aside from the responsibility of the Philippine government, also of the host governments, right? Because we, we do know that a lot of countries don't actually allow um, migrants to bring their families, especially those in lesser scaled categories. And it's like a systemic thing. And sometimes there's also... There are a lot of issues embedded in that. For example, if you are from the global south, you're probably less likely to have that opportunity to bring your family with you when you go overseas. So it's built into the to the system where you have to be separated from your families. Like some of our migrants are not even allowed to get pregnant when they're overseas and they're abroad when they're in a that age of reproductive, um, reproductive peak health, right? So many issues that unfortunately we can't cover everything here but um i also just do want to acknowledge that there are comments from miss rose escalada and um i think uh miss rose is saying that our labor offices and our embassy in tokyo japan in osaka and in nagoya do have a lot of programs for our ofws in fact miss rose i want to recognize that um our foreign service posts in Japan were among those that were very active in the programs, uh, such as webinars and workshops that we've been organizing um, in Bridge, the Bridge program. So I, I do recognize that there really is that effort, but, uh, and I will let uh, Dr. Jo chime in on this as well, but I think what Dr. Jo is saying is that she was just reporting what her interlocutors what her subjects have been sharing as well, no? So this is not necessarily her her own view. Um, would you like to say something, Dr. Jo? I think there is no denying that the Philippine Embassy is doing, you know, its its job, no, in supporting, assisting, providing information. In fact, there were some respondents who also echoed that they got some support, some money from Polo during the pandemic, and they appreciate that they. Uh, they were able to access that, no, given the very limited, um, you know, knowledge about it. The truth is, there's a tendency for Filipinos to triangulate. So even if you know, the, the, even if probably they're not able to get maybe the information that they need, uh, maybe from the Facebook page or website, no, of of the embassy, they turn to their peers, they turn to their employers. So they talk to some of the, uh, you know, agencies, no, um, um concern in the the local uh, uh residential area no they 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 where they are residing so it's it's not that they are dependent solely on online sites so they always turn to various no agencies for support and information but this does not make me say that the government is not doing anything at all this is just to say that there are people who really have strong opinions about how 
quote in quote inadequate <laughs> the embassy uh, uh, has been doing so far and so it needs to be complemented by all the other kinds of assistance that are being avail made av available in other you know agencies or other right. channels so and yeah. in fact i think what would be interesting dr cho will be to approach this these people and to invite them mm. to become partners sure. of the embassy to challenge them like you have suggestions then we'd love to work with you and um uh, ambassador rico foss we oh, actually we hope rico. we don't you don't mind that we promoted you into a panelist because Please. you have of course been one of the faces of dfa's um assistance to migrant workers before you were you're in norway if i'm not mistaken would you like to offer some some thoughts on the discussion so far yeah yeah thank, thank you very much i was intently listening since the, the start i had problems earlier on 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 technical side but good that i was able to come in and listen into the two uh lectures that's why in my in my chat i was asking if i could request for a copy of the slides or even uh, possibly lecture notes. So they were very interesting uh, uh, discussion. Um, good morning from Oslo. Magandang hapon dyan sa Manila. Maybe a few things. One, I really support uh, Dr. Joe's uh, message that there should be collaboration between the non-government actors in agencies in the government, as you see in the government, the Philippine embassy, and all over the world, uh, be it in Tokyo, be it in Saudi Arabia, be it in Ankara, where Jed Ayang is, or, or in, 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 in my place here, there's always been a call for collaboration, but as you know, uh, and it's a reality that not all organizations out there would rather collaborate. And I think it's, it's rooted also in what we have when we start in the Philippines, when we go out the first people that we would want to collaborate with are our families, our friends. And it takes a lot of effort. It takes a lot of effort and uh, intentions for us to collaborate with agencies out there. May, may it be a, a government institution or a host government institution or a non-government institution. Ang una-una nating lalapitan ka mag-anak natin dun sa lugar. Eh. Ang una-una nating lalapitan ka ibigan natin sa lugar o kababayan natin ka kamag-aral natin, et cetera. No? It's a second layer. It's a second layer when we go to organization, be it organ a government or not a government organization. Be as it may, no? Be as it may, I think uh, there is an active effort from the Philippine government through the embassies abroad to reach out to the people. Especially there's there's an, an open-ended uh, uh, program for assistance to nationals in distress. In fact, as maybe uh, all of you would know that uh, one of the major pillars, one of the three pillar, pillars of uh, the Philippine foreign policy is assistance to nationals. And we are obligated and mandated and both legally and morally obligated to reach out to uh, our nationals abroad. So parang, ano yan eh, parang given, it's, it's a fact of life for foreign service post personnel, me at an ambassador to the driver. No? Pa, pa, lahat yan. Uh, Secondly, maybe I would like to emphasize also that while Triple Win, this is the, the program for the nurses and healthcare workers that we have now in, in Germany, we're trying to replicate it in other areas. You have to, the beauty of that program is that it's uh, tripartite in nature, where as stated, uh, the the employers themselves, the employers, the employers in the governments are fully involved from the very start of the recruitment process to the pre pre employment to the employment even after the the post employment process. So it's a complete migration cycle intervention by by the government. No, um, uh, th th that's a beauty. So even in I I've been involved in the negotiations as well in the review of that process um for some it it is a slow process because it's so tedious and very very detailed and that's why in the later parts of uh, later later years uh, uh private private uh, recruitment agents were allowed to participate already uh so there are two tracks now 
in the in the triple win project the the, the private uh, truck private recruitment truck and and the government uh, recruitment truck so uh, just the same uh, it, it 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 is a concept that uh, involves uh, the employee the employers and the government that's why it's called triple win project um, it's it's a bilateral uh, bilateral one thing that must, must remember though in in the in that in that uh, in that uh, in that program is that the host government must be cooperative it is our decide it's the philippine government's decide to do that and replicate that in all other programs that we have in terms of bilateral relations and on bilateral labor relations but uh, it takes another government especially the host government to to dance with us on this so and we are we're doing and thank you for mentioning this now we're doing as much as we can in the government to to in, engage and involve uh, the the host government in doing a collaborative again uh, i like the the the, the 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 word collaborative because it's all, always a collaborative work between governments and between uh, sectors and stakeholders including the academy of course uh, that brings me to my third point i think you must we must all factor in uh, the global compact on migration in all our discussion may it be on decent work may it be on climate and effects on 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 labor may it be on the green economy and i'm, I'm glad that uh, you're bringing up the green economy and the green transition in relation to labor migration in relation to uh uh, to the protection of migrant workers, particularly women migrant workers, because this is a new frontier for a lot of us, and we must include in the discussion, uh, in the discussion, uh, this, 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 this matters. But at the same time, um, we must, I think, I think, and, and I would, I would ask everyone to consider working also on 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 the framework of the global compact for migration where as we say in the philippines it's the way to decently uh, treat migrants regardless if you are government if regardless if you are an ngo regardless if you are an individual or regardless if you are an employer um i just uh, just for example maybe how effective is the global compact for migration is uh all countries in the middle east all receiving countries in the middle east signed in are uh, adopted the global compact of migration. This was the platform we use in discussions with Saudi Arabia, for example, on labor mobility, or with Qatar on labor mobility and the abolition, for example, of, uh, of the exit visa process, or in the Bahrain for the transformation from uh, the, the taxi visa system in Bahrain, transformation from illegal, uh, irregular migration. To a regular migration pattern in Bahrain for many of our workers there uh, who had been suffering from the vulnerabilities of being an irregular migrant in, in the Middle East. And this is very important to, to us in the Philippines because a large, a large, a very large portion of the migrant workers are, are workers in the in, in the Middle East, in the so-called GCC area. So or maybe maybe on three points uh, and and thank you very much again uh, for doing thank this you very uh, much. for doing this uh, webinar and for the the ideas that has brought in 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 the discussion maraming maraming thank you very much uh, ambassador always, ambassador yeah, we are also ready to to engage uh, if, if needed all right maraming thank salam. you very much ambassador rico and um thank you again to our two panelists now, i i wish we had much longer to discuss because we were barely able to scratch the surface. Um, by way of wrapping up our discussion, again, we will send the materials that um, have been shared as well as those from Ambassador Anke Reifenstuhl of Germany, who unfortunately could not join us, but will share her materials. And by way of closing, I will pick up on what um, Ambassador Rico Foss has mentioned on the importance of the Global Compact for Migration. And um, in the bridge program, we are also using one of the principles of the Global Compact, which is um, the desire to use evidence-based policy, evidence-based approaches 
in, in enhancing labor migration policy, as well as um, another overarching principle of the GCM is gender responsiveness. So another project that we are doing in Bridge is this hackathon. It's called DataQuest, Gender Responsive Labor Migration. And we would like to invite all of you to the final pitch session on Thursday, this Thursday, where 15 finalists will pitch their ideas. No, this could be solutions, data visualizations, or other data-driven projects. So you may join either through Zoom, but since we have a maximum um, audience of 100 there, you are also welcome to view the live stream at the Facebook page of our partner, Serolytics. So that's facebook.com slash Serolytics. So just to give you an idea of the projects of the 15 finalists, you will find them in the lists there. And I hope that you will be as intrigued by the names of the projects as uh, we were when we first saw these proposals. So again, that's happening this Thursday, and we hope that you could join us. And um, I guess it's a good um, way to end on that note and to once again thank everyone, to thank our partners, UPCFAL, for um, co-organizing this activity with us, led by Dr. Edna Ko, the team, um, Katrina, Elora, Arian, and the others in the team. Also, thank you very much, of course, to our speakers, Dr. Jocelyn Celero and Dr. Cleovi Mostuela, our friends from DMW who are here, um, and all our friends from the different government agencies and CSOs. Thank you for joining us and hope we hope that you will continue this, we can continue this conversation, possibly through the ongoing drafting of the new Philippine Development Plan. So let's get um, this idea of feminist labor migration policy in there, if not in name, then the principles behind it. So again, thank you very much and do keep safe, everyone. Have a lovely rest of the afternoon.